But I'm going to do my best here in the next few minutes to bring you along vicariously on a space shuttle launch. So I want everybody to suspend disbelief, to pretend that we're all fellow crew members. It's T minus three hours before liftoff. We're walking from the crew quarters, we climb into the crew van, drive to the launch pad, take the elevator to the cockpit level, exit that, walk across the access arm. We enter the white room where we're dressed in our harnesses, then we get out on our hands and knees, <clears throat> excuse me, and crawl into the cockpit. There'll be technicians inside that'll lay us back into our chairs. They will strap us to those chairs, and then as they leave, they will close the side hatch, the access arm will be retracted, and we will be left alone. T minus 15 seconds, and our hearts are pounding in deep adrenal surges. T minus 10 seconds, go for main engine start. Atlantis has checked a thousand items, pressures, temperatures, voltages, valve positions, and now she's screaming, yes, yes, I'm ready, I can fly. T minus nine, eight, seven, six, main engine start. We hear nothing of the remaining count. The cockpit is violently wrenched as Atlantis's three liquid engines explode to life. The instruments blur with the vibrations. The commander reaches forward and seizes the instrument panel glare shield trying to steady himself. Then the solid rocket boosters ignite. We're slapped into our seats with the force of nearly two gravities as Atlantis leaves from the Earth. If we could look back and down, we can't, but if we could, we would see a scene very similar to this. This is a view of an unmanned rocket launching, but it looks similar with a space shuttle with the rocket motor igniting, the rocket zooming away from the launch pad, and the launch complex receding in the background. It's thank God we don't have this perspective on a space shuttle. It scares us more than we already are. Uh, back in the cockpit of a shuttle looking straight up, and that's your perspective here, any clouds above us will race into our faces, disappear behind us. The sky will blacken very quickly. Within two minutes, the sky will be pitch black. Uh, at two minutes and 12 seconds, we'll hear this loud bang see this fire across the windows as these boosters are explosively separated, and then it gets dead quiet. For the next six and a half minutes, we'll continue into space on the three liquid-fueled engines, burning liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen out of that big orange gas tank. But from here on up, it's very smooth, very quiet. The only way you can tell you're moving besides looking at your instruments are the G-forces slowly building on your body, and those will ultimately stabilize at three times the force of gravity. That is not like the science fiction movies where you see people's faces being peeled back off their skull like that. It's not like that, but it does feel as if somebody's sitting on you. It's a little hard to breathe and hard to talk at three Gs. And this entire process that I just described to you, from liftoff, zero altitude, zero speed, to being in an orbit around 200 miles above the Earth at a speed approaching five miles per second, that entire process takes just 10 minutes. It's a very short, violent, and frankly, terrifying 10 minutes. Now, I wanted to share that narrative with you to give you an appreciation of what it's like to be tied into the cockpit of one of these things and be bl blasted into space. And with that appreciation, I ask you this question. If we had not been pretending, if this had been for real, if all of you truly had been tied to four million pounds of propellant, what type of a team would you want out there holding your life in their palm? Well, I had numerous opportunities to ponder that question, and the answer I came to is I think the identical answer you would come to in the identical circumstance. When your life is on the line, you're going to want a team that's the best holding it in their palm. And how do teams get to be the best? They get there by practicing fundamentals, by doing little things consistently and religiously day in and day out until they become as natural as breathing. You don't even think about them. When my life is on the line, when I'm involved with any team, I want everybody on that team understanding the dangers of a normalization of deviance. I'll define that here in just a moment. I want everybody understanding the essence of responsibility as it applies to the individual as well as it applies to the team leaders. And I want a team that's filled with courageous self-leaders. Uh, in the end, folks, it's how well we lead ourselves. It certainly determines how far we go personally and certainly how far we go professionally and how far we take our teams. Uh, it's how well we lead ourselves. I don't think enough is discussed about self-leadership, so I want to talk about that as a, one of the teamwork fundamentals. Uh, I'm going to use experiences I had both as an Air Force flyer and as a NASA astronaut to develop points on these, on these fundamentals. Okay, that mechanically reviews for you what was going on with Challenger. Let's now talk about these fundamentals, and let's begin with the discussion of normalization of deviance. What is this? Well, it's that natural human tendency, particularly in pressure situations, to want to take a shortcut, to accept a lower standard of performance. Uh, maybe it's a lower standard of personal performance. 
Maybe it's a lower standard of uh, performance for some machine you oversee, or lower standard of performance for a team you lead. What kind of pressure are we talking about? Personal pressure. Maybe there's some, something going on with the family. Maybe it's budget pressure, schedule pressure. But you're in a situation. You have standards that are expected of you. You've been trained to meet those standards. You have everything in place to meet those standards, but you rationalize, I can't do this job and meet these standards because of this pressure I'm under. I'm going to have to take a shortcut. Oh, I'm only going to do it this one time. Next time, I'll do it the way I know I'm supposed to do it. Okay, so you take that shortcut, you accept that lower standard of performance, and guess what? Nothing bad happens. You get away with it. What's liable to happen the very next time you're in these same circumstances? Because nothing bad happened the last time, you're going to be mightily tempted to do the same thing again. And if you do it enough times, you start making that shortcut enough times, and after a while, you lose sight of this deviance that you've accepted. 